Hey guys, my name is Ethan with GoBuilda, and today we're going to show you how to prototype FTC robots with radio control systems. Here at GoBuilda, in a lot of our prototyping and R&D, we use radio control systems to really quickly get things up and running. And that's because it's a primarily plug and play system that's been developed and is very reliable and is primarily used in the radio control hobbies like RC cars and RC airplanes. We think these can be really helpful to some FTC teams who are after really rapid development without the need to work in programming and to specifically work with FTC legal electronics. All of this stuff is not FTC legal, you couldn't take it to a competition, but our hope is that it could let you get up and running really quickly and more quickly develop prototypes and figure out what works for your robot. All right, here on the table, we've got most of the components in the 12 volt control bundle that you can find on the website. The 12 volt control bundle is really geared toward getting a chassis up and running really quickly and has all the parts you'd need to make a simple skid steer style chassis work. We're gonna need some additional components to get our more complex robot working, but most of the components we're gonna use are in that control bundle. So it's a really convenient option to get a lot of the parts. Now it'll include a 12 volt battery charger a 12 volt go build a battery. They aren't FTC legal, but FTC legal batteries would be compatible with everything else in the system. We've got an XT30 Y harness to power both of our motor controllers with the single battery input. And we've got the transmitter and receiver set. This transmitter is very similar to what you'd use to fly an RC airplane. And it's what you'll actually be interacting with when you're driving the robot around. The receiver is what you'll mount to your robot. It's got eight rows of pins. Now these pins will accept a standard servo TJC8 connector that you can find on most servos or you'll find on motor controllers. Now the middle pin there is gonna be your voltage pin. The far right pin is gonna be your ground pin and the left pins are going to be signal pins. These will spit out PWM signals and they may be a slightly narrower range than you're used to to drive servos. Now this range was chosen originally to make it so that most of your hobby servos are gonna rotate exactly 90 degrees on this signal range, because that's about what you need for most RC applications, but it's probably narrower than you're used to in FTC. So if you plug in your servos and they don't rotate as far, that's why. You may need to look at a servo travel tuner if you need to really increase that range for your prototype. Now, when you go to plug in your motor or servos, you may wonder which ports should I plug them into? And the first six are gonna be labeled. Those are gonna correspond with inputs that you'll have on your transmitter. The first input you'll have on your transmitter is going to be with the gimbal. The right gimbal, you'll move, move to the right and left, and that's going to uh, correspond with a signal that'll be sent out by this channel one on the receiver, and it'll control either position or speed of your servo or the speed of your motor in your motor controller. The second channel is up and down on that, on that gimbal. Um, the third channel is gonna be up and down on your other gimbal, and the fourth channel is gonna be left and right on that other gimbal. Now you'll notice most of these axes are sprung. They'll return right to center. Whereas the third channel is a throttle channel, it is not sprung, so it'll stay exactly where you leave it. The fifth channel is this three position switch. It's really great for controlling servos, and that's how we'll use it later. And the sixth channel is a dial that gives you more precise control of, similarly, servos. I've also used this for intakes on previous robot in three days. Now, these components all integrate together really well and create a very sweet plug and play system. So let's go through the process of making a couple of motors run along with a servo on this transmitter setup. First, we'll plug our battery into our XT30 splitter, and then we'll plug in both of our motor controllers. Right now, our motor controllers are getting 12 volts. They would send tw up to 12 volts of power to our motors, and they've actually got all three of the wires on the servo connector. Now, unlike a standard servo where the, the red wire is carrying power to the servo, this is actually back feeding six volts to power either your servos or your receiver. So it makes powering your receiver really easy. Now we plugged in our servo, or our receiver, and the lights started blinking pretty slowly. That means that we don't have a paired uh, transmitter turned on. When you first get your transmitter and receiver set, it won't be paired. 
you'll need to click the bind button when you plug it in. I like to use a 2.5 millimeter hex key. It reaches in that hole just nice and your receiver will start blink blinking more rapidly. At that point, turn on your transmitter and the LED will switch to being solid. That's how you know it's paired. Now, in this case, we've got our first motor controller connected to channel one. We'll grab our motors and we'll plug one of them in to that motor controller. At that time, we have a motor that is controlled by channel one on the transmitter. Now you get proportional speed control with the GoBuild the Speed controllers. So if you need to go slower, you can, or increase and go to full speed. Now our second um, motor controller has power. We're gonna go ahead and plug it into channel two on the receiver. We'll plug in our motor and we'll have separate control of a second motor with a second motor controller by moving this joystick up and down. Now you'll notice we can control both at once by moving that joystick around in three dimensions. Sometimes you may want to drive a skid steer style robot with what we call arcade drive. What that would mean is when you push the stick forward, the robot's going to drive forward. When you push the stick to the side, the robot's going to turn. This requires what we call channel mixing. It'll mix the both output one and two uh, with the inputs one and two and create the desired effect. We're going to turn that on by changing mix mode to B and we're gonna turn on channel mixing. That'll mean when we push the stick forward, both motors are gonna go. When we push the stick to the side, both motors are gonna go, and basically they're going to alternate the direction. We're gonna turn that back off for now, and we're gonna look at these four switches that are called the servo reverser switches. Now, all these do is change the default direction that the servo or motor you have plugged into this goes when you move that channel. So for example, I'll push this up so it's spinning, and I'll switch channel two it'll reverse the direction of that input. So if you have your robot set up and it's driving backwards compared to how you'd like it to drive, you may need to flip the servo reversing lever. Now I mentioned you can control servos with this as well. Let's go ahead and plug this servo into channel five and use the three position switch to change the servo. Now you can plug this into any of those channels, um, but in most applications, I really like channel five. Now there's one switch that we haven't talked about on this transmitter uh, up until now, and that's called the rate switch. This changes the rate um, and basically the output signal range that channels one, two, and four respond to. Now these make it easier to fine control your motors and servos, especially on a drivetrain, and gives you a little bit better, basically fine control. It makes it so they can't go as fast. This is really nice for those applications where you need to slow something down and get an example of how our motor is going to act if it's a different ratio or if you just would limit that speed in programming. Most of the time you want to keep that up toward yourself, it gives you the full speed of your motors and the full range of your servos. Here's a robot that we're going to be working with today. It's a fairly simple robot. It's a strafer chassis with a single motor arm and two servos for a claw. You'll notice this requires exactly six inputs to control, which is how many we have on our transmitter and receiver setup. Now this uses primarily two additional electronics components. It uses an XT30 power distribution board that just takes an XT30 input and gives you a bunch of outputs. We have five individual motor controllers on this, this robot, so having all of those outputs is really handy. The other thing we'll, we'll need is a Mechanum mixer. Now, with a mechanical wheel chassis, you ideally want to have three inputs, forward and backwards, steering, and strafing left and right. Now, you'll notice you have four outputs. You have four individual motors that you need to control to create your omnidirectional movement. And there's some software that goes along in creating those three inputs to four outputs conversion. And the mechanical mixer does that. It also has some features like channel reversing for the individual outputs and a test button to make that easier. Um, but you can check out the data sheet for exactly how to wire that up. And we'll show a wiring diagram on the screen. Now this motor, this mechanic mixer is controlling four individual motor controllers, one for each motor on the chassis. It's taking those three inputs from the receiver, specifically channels one, two, and four, and going into the mechanic mixer and the power that is fed from the individual motor controllers will travel back through the mixer into the receiver to power the receiver. Now we have one more motor controller on this system and that's plugged straight into the receiver to control the arm motor. 
Now, because these motor controllers are simple speed controllers, they are controlling, they are an open loop controller, as we call it. Basically, you control the speed and direction, and that's not as ideal for controlling an arm. You can certainly get into more complex motor controllers that allow you to create a closed loop control using the motors and coders, and that will let you run to specific positions, but that's outside the scope of today's video. So we have that on channel three, that motor arm. So we can push it up and it applies some power to the motor to allow the arm to spin, but you could overextend this. So if you have a chassis like this, make sure not to leave motor, apply, motor power applied um, when the motor is against the end stop of the system. You just have to be careful when you're driving an arm like this or a linear slide with an open loop control system. Now we of course have the other movement vectors from our Mechanum wheels on the other joystick channels. And then we have the two servos each plugged into their own channel. Channel six is the right control, or, and that gives us um, really fine control over that servo's position. And then with channel five, we get really quick to actuate um, switch positions. So we can drive up to a game element, get it about exactly where we need with channel six, and close the claw with channel five. Now this, Again, it was all plug and play. Um, the only other uh, piece of this puzzle that we used is an XT30 extension, just to put our battery in a more advantageous position. Now, when you're prototyping with FTC, you may not always wanna use a remote control setup. So I'd recommend taking a look at the Servo Commander. It's a pretty simple device that just has a dial that can control either a servo's position or speed if it's a continuous servo, or control the speed of a motor controller. This lets you really gra quickly grab a motor controller and a battery, plug it into your motor, and prototype your mechanism. If you have any questions about these or other products we sell in Gobilda, make sure to shoot us an email over to tech at gobilda.com.